It's good to be back with you all this morning. We've been thinking about forgiveness as we've studied God's Word for the first three Sundays of June, and now we are continuing that, but we're turning a, tor- a corner this morning. We've all been wronged. We have all been hurt. We have all been disappointed by other people. And we ourselves, frankly, have hurt others. We have wronged others. We have disappointed other people. And therefore, forgiveness is of importance for all of us, especially as believers. I mean, forgiveness is the fundamental element of the Christian faith when you think about it. We enter the Christian faith through the door of forgiveness by God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so it is so important to understand at a close level forgiveness, but not my words. We need to hear God's words. We need God's truth on this subject. So for the first three Sundays of June, we studied our Lord's parable of a father and his two sons, better known as the prodigal son parable. And in that, we considered the lavish joyful forgiveness of God the Father to us. I call it vertical forgiveness, starting at God's end and coming down to us. And we all need this. We all understand this. This is how we enter the Christian life. And so this morning we are transitioning to the way in which we are now, as believers, called to go out and share this forgiveness with other fallen sinners. Forgiven sinners, many of them, but fallen sinners nonetheless. So we deal with the saved and the lost as according to Christ. We don't have a different standard because we're going to be a Christian with whomever we're with. We don't wear masks, but we are his people. We belong to Jesus. And so we will call this horizontal forgiveness because it's in this earthly realm And that brings us to our study for this morning. I want you to open your Bible to the small epistle to Philemon. Philemon. It's barely one page in my Bible. It's tucked between Titus and the larger book of Hebrews in the New Testament, if that helps you find it. Philemon is a private letter. Really written from one man to another man. And he's a believer, but it involves the entire church at Colossae. And this fact alone tells us that forgiveness impacts all of us as followers of Christ. Not just personally, but corporately, meaning to all the members, all the people in the church. Because forgiveness is a community matter. And I would say Forgiveness is a gospel matter. It all goes back to the gospel. As Christians, we therefore take forgiveness very seriously. So what does it look like? What does forgiveness entail? How does it work? Let's see pictures of forgiveness in action. That's what Philemon gives us. It gives us all of these pictures of forgiveness. And as a way of getting us into this beautiful narrative... I want to just read the first three verses just to get us started. This gets us into the entry, the doorway of Philemon. And then I want to spend a a lion's share of our time this morning just giving you the background of Philemon. Because if you don't have the background, none of our understanding of the verses, if we just parachute into the book, it will not have as much meaning, won't make as much sense to you if you don't have the background in this case study of forgiveness. So now, if you're physically able to do so, in honor of God and his word, if you would, please stand with me as I read these first three verses of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, as we gather in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, this morning, we confess that forgiveness sounds so wonderful and good until we have been deeply hurt. 
and then it's our turn to forgive somebody who has hurt us. I ask that your powerful word would have emancipating influence on every heart and every conscience this morning as we join together to submit to your word. I ask that you would set us free from every sinful chain that holds us, that you would break those chains with your word. And may this truth transform our lives with gospel healing and make the way that we relate to other believers and to the lost around us in this world holy and something that is healing. We ask this for the sake of the gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So before I exposit these opening three verses, which really won't take that long, uh, I need to spend a good bit of time just giving you the background and the context of this amazing letter. And I know some of you are very familiar with Philemon, uh, with people who have gone through the letter of Philemon many times. Some of you have taught through Philemon, uh, but others may not know very much about it at all. So I want to get everybody onto the same page and just go through the background so we all know where we are as we head into this beautiful letter. It was written around 60 A.D. while Paul was under house arrest in Rome. And Paul had been in prison many times. Now he's under house arrest in Rome. And so this is one of the four prison epistles in the Bible. It is usually grouped with Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. We put Philemon in that group of four prison epistles. Paul had been arrested most likely when he was on his third missionary journey. And this is during a time in which Paul was ministering around Ephesus. Now, if you think about the map of modern-day Turkey, Ephesus is on the western coast of modern-day Turkey. And so Paul was ministering around there. And Colossae is further east. It's inland, about 130 miles from Ephesus. And we don't have any record that Paul ever visited Colossae. But we know he was in Ephesus, and he trained the Ephesian elders there for at least three years. So we know he was very familiar with Ephesus. And a meeting, and this is a little speculative, but we have to assume that a meeting must have occurred when Paul was in Ephesus. And Philemon must have been at that meeting. That would have been one of the closest times that Paul would have met with Philemon, who is living in Colossae. It wouldn't be at all uncommon for somebody living in Colossae to make that journey of 130 or so miles to Ephesus, because that is a major city, a major dispatch. Timothy was also at that meeting. This explains the reference to Timothy at the beginning of the letter. Now, Philemon, that's a very important name. Timothy, we know about Timothy. He was likely the young protege, the pastor of the church at Ephesus at one time. And this is years prior when they met, prior to the arrest of Paul. So Paul led Philemon to Christ. That was a huge gospel entry point when Paul led Philemon to Christ. And this helped to spread the gospel into Colossae. Now another name that's very important is Onesimus. Onesimus is very important because he is the human reason why Paul is writing this letter to Philemon. The man Philemon was a believer, but he was likely a wealthy Christian. And a couple of the reasons we think he was wealthy, although the Bible doesn't tell us this, we know some things about him. First of all, the church of Colossae met in his house. So that tells us he had a house big enough for all of the Colossian church to meet there. And he used his address, his house, his living room, as it were, for the church to meet. So he has a big house. Another thing is, he owns slaves. Now that's controversial to even say that, but it also speaks to his wealth. And it tells us in the first century, for someone to have a lot of land and a big house, he had slaves. And we know he has slaves because one of them is named Onesimus, and he's the one for whom this book is written. So Onesimus was one of the slaves of Philemon, and the backstory is Onesimus had 
for whatever reason, stolen some goods, and he fled as a fugitive from Philemon's property. Now, this was all when Onesimus was not a believer. He was not a Christian when he did this. And because of this background, when we're talking about slavery in 21st century America, we have to say a word about the distinction between first century slavery and the slavery that characterized the early centuries of our own American history. We need to understand slavery, not just to understand Philemon, but really to understand the whole Christian life. Because the Christian life, and this is so amazing when you think about it, the Christian life is framed as a slave-master relationship between us and Jesus. I could say it this way. No one will enter the kingdom of heaven unless they are first a slave. But understand, I mean a slave of Jesus, meaning he is the master. So that's our understanding. The slave-master relationship is what Jesus used, as awkward as that is, that's what Jesus used to frame and describe the Christian relationships. We want to please Jesus. We want to serve him in every way we can in this brief sojourn called life. Now, let me say rather quickly that the slavery that characterized first century Rome was very different in many ways from the slavery that we experienced here in the United States. First of all, Roman slavery was never based on ethnicity. There was never an ethnic distinction between the master and the slave, or at least rarely. Roman slaves were most often of the same ethnicity as their masters. As much as a third of the Roman Empire were slaves. So we're talking about a huge thing that is almost tantamount to a form of employment. But I want to stop short of that because that makes it sound a little too glorified. I don't want to make it sound like it was all rosy and good to be a slave in the first century. But it is closer to what we think of as an employee relationship in some ways. And so what happened in Philemon is that Onesimus stole some goods. He fled away under the cover of darkness and he was gone. He was gone a long way. How far did he go? He went from Colossae to Rome. That's about at least 1,300 miles. And because of the old roads that were rather circuitous, it may have been up to 1,500 miles. So we're talking about not days, but weeks of walking as a fugitive. And because running away as a slave was a capital offense under Roman law, if he had been caught, it could mean the death sentence. And so what he wanted to do, Onesimus wanted to do, was as quickly as possible to go from Colossae into Rome, the capital city of the empire, and he wants to get lost in the crowd. He has no credentials, he has no proof of identity, and he has only the things that he stole from Philemon's house to get away. That's all he has to buy anything. Well, after a while, if you don't have work, you're going to run out of money. You're going to get hungry at some point, and you're going to need a job. Now, I don't know how it happened, but I do know that God, in His beautiful sovereignty, orchestrated all of these things so that Onesimus, according to his own fallen will, chose to go to Rome, and that happens to be where Paul was in prison under house arrest. It's beautiful when you see it from heaven's perspective. But here is a man running away from what he thinks is being caught from whatever that lifestyle was with Philemon in Colossae. And he wants to get lost in the crowd. But God led Onesimus to Paul who can't get out because he's in house arrest. So God had to bring Onesimus to a prisoner. And he brought him to a prisoner, and the prisoner led him to Christ. He explained the gospel, and Onesimus believed. His heart was transformed by believing the truth of the saving gospel. And Paul and Onesimus became fast friends. 
they, they had a, a brotherly love relationship because Onesimus, being a free man, even though he's a runaway slave, he's the free man in this scene because Paul is under house arrest. He is chained to a Roman guard. And Onesimus, the saved man who is now free, is hearing the gospel. And you know what he does? He becomes Paul's hands and feet. He becomes his gopher. He, he goes into town. He gets him food that he needs because do you know that Roman prisoners had to pay their own expenses? They weren't provided free food. They weren't provided free rent for the, the house. He, Paul had to pay the rent on the house where he is staying as a prisoner. That's the way the Roman law was. So it's different from the way we think of prison. So he's under house arrest. Onesimus is there. He comes to faith. He's gloriously redeemed. And now, I imagine Onesimus tells him, Paul, the backstory. He says, uh, you know, I need to tell you something about who I am. And I imagine he shares with him that he came from Colossae. And Paul says, yeah, I, I've never been to Colossae, but I know somebody in Colossae. And I know there's a church in Colossae. And, and Onesimus says, yeah, I, I know about that church because they meet in the house that I ran away from. Oh, really? Yes, I, I came from Philemon's house. Philemon? And Paul says, I know Philemon. He's a very good friend of mine. I, I led him to faith in Christ several years ago. And Onesimus realizes that now there is a mutual connection between this man who led him to Christ and the master from whom he ran. And so now he's on the radar. He now sees that God, the great hound of heaven, is tightening the screws on his life and he is right there. Now he's already been redeemed. He's already saved. And he wants to do everything that his new master Jesus wants him to do. And Jesus, the gracious king, the loving master who died to pay for the sins of all those who would come to be his servants, his slaves, he wants to obey this Jesus. And what he does is he appeals to Paul, what should I do? Now Paul knows, as valuable as Onesimus is to him, he can't keep him. He's got to say, here's what you need to do. You have got to make things right with Philemon. Now you're both brothers in Christ. I know he doesn't know that. And I don't know what was going on that made Onesimus want to run away from Philemon, but he did. And he has irreplaceable things that were stolen. He, he can't pay for those things. Paul doesn't have any money to give him to, to pay Philemon back, at least not on him now. But Onesimus is told he has to go back. Now, if Paul just sent Onesimus back and just said, you know, good luck with that, you're on your own, it would likely lead to the arrest of Onesimus. He would be seen as a fugitive and he would likely be executed. Now, Paul did not want that to happen to this dear brother in Christ. And so he took out his stylus while under house arrest and he began to write a letter. And it's the letter called Philemon that is in our Bibles. And we are going to study this appeal that Paul the Apostle writes to a dear friend of his, a wealthy Christian in Colossae named Philemon. And he's appealing for forgiveness. And he's saying, you must forgive this man who is not just a slave. He is a brother. He is your brother in Christ. You have the blood of Christ in common. And so a letter was sent. Now, back in those days, they didn't have uh, parcel delivery services. They didn't have postal workers. If you wanted to send a letter, you had to find somebody who was going to where you wanted the letter to go, and you would ask them, will you take this with you? And so it was kind of hit or miss whether you could get a letter to someone, especially when you're talking about 1,300 miles from Rome to Colossae. Well, Tychicus was there. Tychicus came by, and Tychicus was a friend of Paul's, a beloved brother who is also going toward Colossae. And he says, I got two letters for you. Now, you didn't know there were two, maybe. But there was Philemon, 
and the letter of Colossians that were written at the same time because they're written to the same people. The church at Colossae was meeting in the home of Philemon and so everything that Paul writes to Philemon affects the entire church at Colossae. And so they have to go together. So Tychicus, you're the man who is going to carry these two that we now know are inspired letters written by the Apostle Paul. Two pieces of sacred scripture are going back to Colossae and you're going with Onesimus. You see, Onesimus is not going alone. He's going with Tychicus, but he's also going with two inspired letters by the Apostle Paul. And one of them would be his warrant of emancipation. Maybe not in a literal sense, because he would still be a slave, but it would emancipate him in a brotherly sense as a believer and put him on equal footing with Philemon at the foot of the cross. The letter would be a charter of emancipation that would ultimately undo all the bonds of slavery in civilized places where the gospel has taken root. This is where slavery has been most decimated, is in places where the church has preached the gospel and has treated all men as equal in Christ Jesus. And so we need to preach the gospel. I want you to listen to the end of Colossians in chapter 4, verse 7, where Paul writes about this transfer. He writes to the church, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. So that's the end of Colossians 4, that's toward the end. And when Paul writes this letter to Philemon, he is switching back and forth between the second person singular pronouns referring to Philemon and the second person plural referring to the whole Colossian church. So he's going back and forth. So you'd know he's not just talking to one man. He's talking to the whole church when he is writing Philemon as well as the book of Colossians. Now this is because, and I said this before and I say it again, forgiveness and repentance are not just private matters. They are church corporate matters. They affect every believer in the body of Christ because if you have two people in a local church who don't like each other and aren't talking, you at the very least don't have peace. But you also have a form of sickness in the body corporate. And it is a sickness that Jesus doesn't aim to overlook. He wants us to deal with it with the gospel tools. And the primary gospel tool that is affected is forgiveness. Forgiveness. It is the divine scalpel that cuts out that, that tumor called unforgiveness and removes it from the body of Christ, from the church. Now Onesimus' very life is dependent on forgiveness as he goes back to the house of Philemon. And this short letter makes a case for Philemon to receive this converted runaway slave with abundant grace forgiving him as a fellow brother in Christ. I can say that Christianity knows nothing of a hopeless case. You might think you know of a hopeless case, but I can top it with stories that I've heard of stories that are maybe sounding more hopeless than the one that you could think of where Christ has overruled, where Christ has redeemed those broken situations. Even a broken trust between a slave and a master can be restored if Jesus has united them both in, in faith. They are, after all, equal at the foot of the cross. And within this letter, as well as the other writings in the New Testament, the roots that once held slavery together are severed. They are broken forever as Christians led the way to emancipation. Now, at the time of the New Testament, most slaves were born into this structure as second or third generation slaves. And slaves in the first century could be a number of things. I mean, they could be physicians, they could be teachers, musicians, librarians, artists, lawyers, accountants. Almost every discipline was represented by slaves. And instead of attacking slavery directly in the first century, 
New Testament Christianity began to destroy slavery from the inside by spreading the gospel town by town, individual by individual. Human bondage and unjust economic inequality would be weakened not by social reforms, not by politicians, but by redeemed hearts, by preachers preaching the gospel and by Christians going out with the gospel into the community and not just saying they believe it, but live it out. They live it out. And Philemon, you would never see this in the Bible if it had only been heard but not believed and taken action. There had to be action for this this whole message to take root in his life or in our lives. So we must really live out the gospel truth. And this is what Philemon does. We don't know that because it's not written in the Bible, but we know by implication that he must have or it would not have been included in the canon of Scripture. If the Colossian church had received this and they saw that Philemon is still giving a cold shoulder to Onesimus, do you not think they would have held him accountable? Absolutely. And this is what the Apostle Paul intended. He wanted Philemon to be held accountable. He wanted his wife and his son to also be held accountable for how they love this brother named Onesimus as a true believer. Don't treat him as a slave on probation. No, no. He is your equal in Christ. You put him on the same status. In fact, Paul later says, you treat him the way you would treat me. You treat him the way you would treat an apostle. That's elevated. So that's not just equal status. This is elevated status for a slave, a man who is now free in Christ. And so Paul, in addressing the situation in this way, he really addresses all the common abuses of slavery and he elevates slaves until the concept of human slavery becomes detestable in civilized nations where the gospel has taken root. Now, incidentally, I don't want you to think that I am clueless about modern day slavery. Slavery still exists, right? We know that. In fact, I did an online search just a few days ago. There are over 50 million known slaves today in the world. People living in bondage. But I'll tell you this, it is not in places where the church has preached the gospel, where the gospel has gone forward. It is in places which are dominated by Islam, where the Quran holds sway. This is where most of the slavery exists in our world today. But today it is least common, slavery is least common, in areas where churches are preaching the gospel and men and women are believing it and living it, not just professing it, but living it out with their neighbors. And so with that as background, let's get into these first three verses, the opening verses where Paul introduces himself and Timothy. Verse 1 says, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. So let's start with this. The church at Colossae, as I said, was originally meeting in the house of this wealthy believer named Philemon. The personal introduction at the beginning of Philemon is unlike any of the other letters that Paul wrote. Because in no other letter does he say that he is a prisoner for Christ Jesus. That is very distinct. And when he says that, he's not only speaking of his submissive relationship through faith in Jesus Christ, but he's also talking about his literal situation as a prisoner who is physically chained to a Roman soldier in the city of Rome. Now, by writing this, Paul is obviously not emphasizing his authority as an apostle, but his humble submission as a servant of Jesus. And remember, these men are friends. Paul is writing not as the boss of Philemon, but he is a spiritual father. And when somebody is a spiritual father, when it's the person who led you to faith in Christ, that gives you a sense of authority. You listen to your fathers. You respect your fathers, especially spiritual fathers in the faith. And so Paul expects Philemon to submit to this because he's not saying anything for himself. He's saying this for the gospel. You must obey this is the context. You must, Philemon, obey this for the sake of the gospel. And so he begins with this humble opening. He doesn't come in with authority. That might be offensive if he did. 
but he's very humble. And keep in mind, he knows this man, and Philemon probably knew Timothy when they had that meeting together several years earlier. And so Paul is apparently with Timothy while he's under house arrest in Rome. He is our brother, and he was also the church uh, pastor at Ephesus. Timothy was. And so it's mainly addressed to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. Now notice the word beloved. I think that's a very interesting word. It tells us he is not a reluctant member of the church. He loves to be part of the church. Philemon is one of those see a need and meet it kind of guys. He comes to church looking for who can I serve? How can I serve? He might say, you know, I, I don't have the teaching gift, but I, I have hospi hospitality. I can be hospitable to people. I can open my home. And his wife says, yes, we can let the church meet in our house. And so that's obviously what they did. He is a beloved fellow worker. He does the hard things that need to be done to honor Christ. And Paul also addresses Philemon's wife and his son. You know why? It's because they share the same burden that Philemon shares if they're going to forgive Onesimus. And there's going to be a reconciliation, not just between these two men, but between the family and Onesimus. And so the wife and the son, they share in this application of forgiveness and reconciliation as members of the same family. Furthermore, Paul wants this epistle read to the entire church at Colossae. Verse 2 makes this clear. Look at verse 2. And Aphia, our sister, that's Philemon's wife, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, I take it that's Philemon's son, and the church in your house. So that's a reference to the Colossian church. I believe that Archippus was likely a preacher at the Colossian church. And I, some of my evidence for that is he's not only called a fellow soldier here in this reference in in Philemon, our fellow soldier, verse 2. But listen to Colossians 4.17, where Paul writes in a letter that went right with Philemon, he writes, and say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. So here's a man who's received a ministry in the Lord, and I take it that he is a preacher, one of the preachers in the church at Colossae. He has a ministry from the Lord there. So the whole family of Philemon is acti actively involved in the church at Colossae. They are public followers of Jesus Christ, and everybody in the church is going to know if they have received this letter well. Everybody's going to know if they obeyed this letter. It's going on record, and I say it again, forgiveness is a corporate matter, meaning it affects all the members of the church, local church. It is a corporate matter because it's a gospel matter. It's bound to happen because we are fallen creatures. We are bound to fall out of sorts with certain people, with each other. We're bound to offend one another or disappoint each other in some way. It's just bound to happen. And so forgiveness has to be addressed and dealt with. You remember the two ladies that Paul had to reference in Philippians 4? He has to put this into the inspired record. In Philippians 4, 2, Paul writes, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. End quote. So it's part of the record that Two ladies that had fallen out with each other need to be reconciled and brought back together. It's because the gospel is at stake when believers remain at odds. Now, if I was counseling any one of you privately, if, you, we, if we were just talking one-on-one -on -one in the office about a situation that you have with somebody about forgiveness and we were talking it out. I imagine if we were talking about an actual scenario, and some of you may be dealing with this, if there's an actual situation, the, the situation would come up. What about somebody whom I've forgiven but they don't accept my forgiveness? 
Or what about somebody who doesn't acknowledge that they did something that needs to be forgiven? That's bound to happen. That's common. We're sinners. We're, we're going to be in denial sometimes. That doesn't make it right, but it, it's just a fact. And so, what about that? Here's, here's the counsel that I would give biblically. After you have done everything on your side to reconcile, whether it's offering forgiveness or seeking forgiveness and restoration with somebody who has offended you, whatever the situation, if the other person refuses to accept forgiveness or your appeal to be forgiven or they just refuse to reconcile, you forgive them anyway. And you lay it at the feet of Jesus. And you operate as if you have forgiven them. In your mind, it's settled. You can't do anything about how they receive it. You can't change their mood. You can't get into their head. God can. If they're a believer, the Holy Spirit can convict them. But you operate on the ground that you have settled it. And if they ever turn and want to repent, you're ready. You're, you're just waiting. Maybe you're praying for them. In fact, you should. You should continue to pray for their reconciliation and restoration, but you operate on the basis that you have forgiven them. That's the biblical counsel. Because our private obedience to Scripture as believers is a matter of great public concern to the church. You know why? Because the devil outwits us. The devil outwits us believers when we think that we can live harboring unforgiveness or when we think we can live in unrepentant sin and get away with it. No one gets away with it. It has effects far-reaching and eternal. We all need to forgive. The value of Philemon on the subject of forgiveness is what led this book to be included in the canon of Scripture because it's applicable to the church in every age. Now verse 3 contains the most familiar part of any of Paul's letters where he writes, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That Pauline greeting is found in all 13 of Paul's inspired letters. Paul always emphasizes the grace of our Lord which grants believing sinners salvation and the peace that results from receiving the grace of God. And that is to be effective not just in us personally but also in us corporately when we gather as a body. And that's why forgiveness is so vital to understand. This peace flows from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, incidentally, is also included in our salvation, although not mentioned in verse 3. God the Father is mentioned, and God the Son is mentioned. And incidentally, whenever Paul links God the Father to God the Son, he is affirming the deity of Christ. You know, it would be blasphemous if God the Father was referenced in parallel form to a mere human teacher. But Jesus is God. He is God the Son. And so Paul links God the Father and God the Son here in parallel form. Jesus forgives all of our many sins against him, and in response, he enables and commands us to go forward in His power to do likewise with others for the sake of the gospel. This is the heart of God's message through Philemon. But who do you need to forgive? I know in a group this size, we, we are all going to be working through this. If we haven't just recently dealt with this, maybe we're presently dealing with this. Or maybe... In just the days to come, you're going to have something that needs to be forgiven. This is to prepare us for what is coming and also to deal with what we're, we're relating to right now with forgiving others who have hurt us or seeking forgiveness where we know that we have wronged others. My counsel is don't let the enemy deceive you. Be reconciled. The gospel really is at stake. And when I say it's at stake, I don't mean the gospel will cease to be true. I don't mean it will fall out of existence. But I mean the fruit of the gospel in your life and in the church will be jeopardized because we haven't taken action on this vital member, this aspect called forgiveness. 
I know the process is not easy. Scripture never says there's anything easy about this. But it's possible because of what Jesus did for us. Let's pray together. Father, we desperately need you to do this. We want to be those who not only hear but are doers of the word. Enable us to shift our frame of reference from what is acceptable by the standards of this fallen culture to the final standard given in your word, the Bible, for our jobs, for the church, for our families, for our finances, for our internal lives. May Jesus Christ be glorified and may the church be strengthened as we submit to you corporately and individually in all things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.